morning, Dr. Brogy. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be able to speak with you. Uh, my name is Keith Murray. I'm calling from eastern Kentucky. Um, I've been a Christian for about 15 years. Um, like most Christians, saved by the grace of God. Uh, yes. And kept by the grace of God. Um I'm grateful to be able to talk to you because you uh, and your ministry has meant so much to me and my wife. Uh, you're such a blessing. Your teaching, your uh, your sermons, uh, we greatly enjoy it. We both study. We don't always study the same things. Uh, I might be studying in one room, uh, and she's studying in another room, another topic from you. But um, the question I, I'm calling, the question I have is I've been in your uh, studies on Revelation for about a year, maybe a year and a half, and I feel like I've just got a glass full of it, and that's all. And uh, uh, I'm having problems with understanding uh, the chronological order of some things. I understand the skeleton of it as you've laid it out. Um, I'm having problems uh, specifically in the area of uh, the two witnesses. The, when is the appearance of the two witnesses? Is it at the beginning of the seven years, or is it in the middle of the seven years? Uh, the problem I've had with believing it's in the middle of the seven years is, by the end, I don't think there's going to be that many people listening or watching their TVs to see uh, those two resurrected. And I'll give you your question, sir. It's a great question. So I would like um, most Bible ex- expositors would put them in the first half of the tribulation. Let me just give some definition. And thanks for calling today, Pete. And appreciate your encouragement, and your prayers, and uh, we're we're thrilled that Search the Scriptures is able to get into places uh, across the world. But we're told here in Revelation chapter eleven about these uh, two witnesses, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So we know right off that um, the seven-year period is divided into two equal halves of 1,260 days, or what we typically call three and a half years, based on a biblical year and how a Jew measured a year at 360 days. And and that's why they would have these insert months every so often because they use a lunar solar calendar or we just use a solar calendar and the Muslims just use a lunar calendar. Anyway, it says if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out from their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, they must they will be killed in this way. So these are real humans, but with uh, their fire-breathing humans. Uh, they have a, a unique power and authority. Of course, if you've listened to the Revelation, there's a lot of uh, debate as to who they are. Um, no one can be absolutely dogmatic. But we do know that the prophet Malachi tells us that Elijah the prophet is coming back during the great and terrible day of the Lord and the beginning of the day of the Lord. There are some very bright, wonderful aspects to the day of the Lord, but it starts with gloom. It mimics a biblical day where things get darker and darker and darker and then bright and then darker, darker, darker. And that's the pattern uh, eschatologically of how God's going to unfold uh, the seven-year tribulation where it gets increasingly worse through the 21 judgments that unfold. Uh, then it becomes incredibly bright when Jesus comes back and we have this long day, so to speak, of a thousand years, but at the end of the thousand years, it gets dark again, where uh, some of the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren born during the tribulation, uh, during the millennial reign, because only believers enter the kingdom, but those who enter in their natural bodies who have survived the great tribulation period as believers, they'll enter into the coming kingdom. And they'll be able to have children, and some of their children won't respond. That may seem amazing to people, but this is why the Bible speaks of the Messiah ruling with a rod of iron. No need to rule with a rod of iron if you have all born-again people in resurrected bodies who can no longer sin. 
but that's part of the reason. Anyway, uh, these are real people, and I suspect they are Elijah and Moses. One, because we know Elijah is coming back during this time. We know that the ministry of these two men mimics that of Elijah and Moses. And we do know that Jesus, when he gives a glimpse of the coming kingdom, meets on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah and Moses. So um, I think if I were to make an educated biblical guess, that that would be my best shot at it. It said when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. This is a reference to the Antichrist. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Gomorrah. Then those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, will not permit their bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. And so you have these uh, lost people celebrating their death. Why? Because they were bringing judgment. Not only are there the seal, uh, trumpet, and bold judgments, but there are also the judgments that God brings through these men. And the focus of the judgments is to bring people to repentance. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here, and they went up. And so now they're gone. Okay, so with that said, When you come into, um, there's kind of a parenthetical note in chapter 12, talking about Israel and what God's plans are for them to protect them. And then chapter 13, that helps us to understand why they, as a Jewish nation, will need protecting. And so we read here, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So there's a second beast. So there are two beasts in the Revelation, the first He has over 30 different titles. His most popular name, of course, is the Antichrist. And then there's this second beast who's also called the false prophet. So you really have this unholy trinity, Satan who takes the place of God the Father. You have the Antichrist or the first beast who takes the place of God the Son. And the third or the second beast or the third member of this unholy trinity who, like the Holy Spirit, points people to the Antichrist and tries to convince them to believe. And so here in the 13th chapter, we discover what is going to happen. It's called by the prophet Daniel, the abomination of desolation. When uh, something dramatic is going to be a game changer during this seven-year period. And it's during this time that we are told specifically at the end of the 13th chapter, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. So the fact that the beast, the Antichrist, goes in the temple and makes himself out to be God would not in and of itself be the abomination of desolation, though that's included in the package because of what goes with it. Jesus obviously went into the temple of God as God, and for him to say that he was God was not an abomination because it was true. And if the Jewish people during the time of the tribulation period are studying the scriptures and recognize, well, Messiah is not just going to be a man, he's going to be God. A baby will be born unto us, and the baby's name, among other titles, will be called Mighty God. And so when the Bible pictures Messiah, he's not simply a human. He is God who's taken on our humanity. And so in and of itself, if, if the Antichrist went in and said, I am the promised Messiah, I'm God, if it were true, it wouldn't be an abomination. But what is the hint to them that this cannot be true? And the hint is, is what we read here. It was given to him, the false prophet, the second beast, to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. 
And of course, it goes on to say you cannot buy or sell anything unless you take his mark, his insignia, 666. And so it's this act of idolatry that would tip every Jew off immediately. There's no way this guy who claims to be Messiah could be the Messiah for the simple reason that the Messiah would not commit or allow an act of idolatry to take place. And so that's the corker. So I say all that to say that these two witnesses that you ask about, they die before this. And you're absolutely right. And, and, and by the way, the timing is definitive based on Matthew 24, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture. And of course, in the Olivet Discourse, I'm just flipping over there right now to Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus makes an incredible statement that he cannot come back until the Jewish people acknowledge that he's the Messiah. And uh, then he goes on and they ask him about the destruction of the temple and the future of Israel. And he speaks prophecy to them. And in verses 4 through 14, he speaks of the birth pangs. And it's not by accident that uh, Matthew 24, 4 through 14 perfectly fits the sealed judgments. And I'll show you how this relates to your question in a moment how it perfectly fits the sealed judgments of Revelation. Uh, So the birth pangs, people say, well, we're seeing the birth pangs. We're not. We're seeing the pregnancy. You have to have a pregnancy before the water can break, and birth pangs begin. And so I think what we're seeing today is the pregnancy, uh, a precursor to many of the things that are going to happen that will happen on a level that we've never seen. And then the midpoint event. How do I know it's the midpoint event? Because if you listen to my series on the prophet Daniel, which I taught before Revelation, and I told our congregation, I said, usually if a pastor is committed to the exposition of Scripture and he wants to teach Revelation, he'll almost always teach Daniel first. Why? Because Daniel's really the schematic to understanding Revelation. And in the Daniel 9, 70 weeks prophecy, it speaks of the 70th week. Jews had not just a week of days, but a week of years. And so a seven-year period that in the middle of this seven-year period, the Antichrist is going to defile the temple. And again, we have commentary in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians 2. He makes himself out to be God. There's an act of idolatry that further defines it, but it is pre uh, foreshadowed, I might say, uh, in the first half of Daniel 11 that speaks of a man who would do it uh, after Daniel had died, and then in the second half of 11 of, of a man who would do it at the end of uh, the church age, after the church has been removed. So therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, verse 15, which was spoken through the prophet Daniel, so where does that place the events that follow? Right in the middle of the seven-year period. And we just read that these two witnesses die before the middle of the seven-year period, because that's when the Antichrist goes in, defiles the temple, And so we go from a one-world multiplicity of religions, and we're seeing the platform set for that. They just had in October a conference uh, that encompassed 2,500 people, um, religious leaders from across the planet, uh, major people. We're, We're talking about right down to the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, coming together, and they signed this covenant for basically a one-world religion and denying the exclusivity. The Pope, Francis, denied the exclusivity of the Christian message that there's salvation in no one else. He signed a document where he put his signature denying the uniqueness of Christ. That ought to be enough to alert any thinking person that he is a false prophet. So again, the mechanics of what is going to happen is being put in place in our day. And when you add to the fact that Israel's in the land, you know you're in that final time frame. And so this event happens, and we go from this multiplicity of religions to a singularity of religion where you worship the Antichrist and him alone. So it's no longer, well, you can be a Hindu or a Catholic or this or that or 
just choose whatever you want and blend them all together. No, now it's you worship me, and if you don't take the mark that symbolizes your commitment to me, you can't buy or sell, and you'll be executed. And millions of people will be executed. So chronologically, it fits perfectly with the revelation where John places it. Now, certainly there are times when John will give a, a preview of what is coming, and, um, but, but not certainly with this. And, and you're right to get to a comment you made. There's not a lot of conversion that takes place in the second half of the tribulation. In fact, the 144,000 and their success is measured in the first half where John in Revelation 7, because of their testimony, sees an untold number like the sands of the seashore from every tribe, nation, and tongue. That's not to say that people can't get saved after the tribulation. Many will, and many will have to make a decision. Am I going to officially renounce Jesus at this point? and take the mark of the beast, in which case that's an irreversible decision. It cannot be undone at that point, or will I embrace Yeshua as the Messiah? So um, as the judgment follows, of course, in in Revelation 8, when the seventh seal is open, unlike the seal judgments where you can see only one at a time, When the seventh seal is open, you can see all the trumpet judgments and all the bowl judgments, and there's silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Here you've got heaven filled with praise and worship, but it's like the breath of people are just taken away. That doesn't mean that they're observing uh, what is taking place on earth, but they have been signaled what is about to take place on earth as to the judgments that will follow. And uh, most people uh, will not respond, but some will, some will. So great question. I appreciate it. And you might want to listen to, in addition, I'm doing a series called God's Prophetic Schedule, and I'm kind of giving all the highlights, and that might chronologically put some things together for you. I've done over 20 messages in it. I think I still have another 10 or so, but um, it will put the chronology maybe uh, in a broader 10,000-foot range uh, view, uh, a little clearer in your thinking. Dr. Carl Brogy answers your questions about the Bible and living the Christian life Tuesday mornings at 11 on The Light, 88.7 FM, and online around the world at wagp.net.